As we're uh, continuing our sermon series, we started six weeks ago looking at the purpose of our church. And we've always said that God has called us to help people believe in God, belong to his family. And our, our tagline used to be, and become fully devoted followers of Christ. But we've, we've made some adjustments. You're going to hear more about that next month. But uh, what, we've, what God's called us to do is to make fully devoted followers of Christ, to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. We do that by helping people believe in God, belong to his family, becoming uh, disciples of Christ, 5W Disciples. And we're going to conclude that part of this series today. Uh, let me also make a plug next month or next weekend, we start our month of missions. Uh, I just believe we will look back on October 2015 and say that was a watershed moment in the life of the church. You won't want to miss uh, any of our weekends in October as we look at what God is calling us to do. Top of your notes, say, look at 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we're talking about today, becoming a disciple of Christ and growing to be all that he wants for us to be. We started, again, six weeks ago looking at, at uh, believe, and we spent two weeks talking about what does it mean to truly believe in God? Because here's what we know. John 3.16 is the most familiar verse in our culture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have, ever, uh, have eternal life. Most everybody you would walk, uh, run into in the street, you would ask them, do you believe in God? Their answer would be yes. But what we need to understand is they, that it, it's only in coming to really understand the biblical belief that it matters. Because what they're saying, most of the people in culture, what they're saying is intellectually, I agree that there must, must be a God. And, and I believe that there was a God, Moses and all that. But they believe in historical facts. That's not what John 3.16 is talking about. John 3.16 is a kind of belief that says, by faith I give my life to Christ. By faith I die to myself so that he can live through me. It, it really is a surrender belief that says... Um, God, I'm yours, and I know you created me for a purpose. I know sin has separated me from that purpose. I know you died on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven and that I could be, be reunited with you and the purpose you created me for. So by faith, I give up control so you can come in, live through me. Biblical belief. But here's what we also know, that once we do believe, that once we become Christians, he doesn't leave us as orphans. He calls us then to become a part of a church and that we're to belong to his family. Look at Galatians 6. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of God. The Bible calls the church many things and, and to help us understand what the church is. And one of the most powerful is it says, this is your family, that you are to be a part of the family. In other words, when you become, become a Christian, you become adopted into the global family of God, but then he wants you to find a family to connect with, a local church to connect with, and we're all to be a part uh, of a church and get, in, get involved in what that church is doing. So, so the Bible calls the church the family of God. It calls the church the bride of Christ, and, and that one day he'll come back for his bride. It calls the church the body of Christ, and we're going to look at that analogy uh, this morning some and why that's important. He calls the church a flock, and he is our shepherd. Now, just, to, just in case you don't understand, that's an insult. But I, I'm just letting you know, all right? Because sheep are the dumbest animals ever created. We've talked about that before. But here's the great thing. He's our shepherd, which means it's his responsibility to protect and to provide and to lead. And we just need to follow. And there's incredible comfort in that. And, and so we're to believe in God, belong to his family, and to, then to become a disciple of Christ. So we say to become a 5W disciple. Because to be a disciple of Christ means that we're, some things are going to change in our lives as we're becoming more like Christ. And we've looked at Scripture and we say there are five things that are good measures on whether I'm becoming Christ-like. 
And, and we have a W to each one of those to help us understand it better. What does it mean to truly be transformed into the image of Christ? What does it mean to be growing in your relationship? What does it look like to be a disciple? And so we have five W's, and we say we covered the first two last week, that a disciple of Christ worships God. That, that's, that they worship God. And you would say, well, of course I worship God. I don't go to service for anything else. I mean, I worship God. I, I, don't, you know, I only sing worship songs. I don't sing songs to you know, my boat. I mean, I, I worship. But here's what you need to understand. Whatever is first in your life, that's what you worship. Whatever is most important in your life, whatever you give the most energy to, whatever trumps everything else, that's what you worship. So for some, it's their work. For some, it's their family or their spouse. For many, we worship ourselves. And we're our own God, small g. And what scripture is very clear, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you worship God. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. He's saying, man, you, your worship must, first of all, be to God. And, and so we're a disciple, fully devoted disciple of Christ, uh, worships God. Secondly, they live according to God's word. How cool on a weekend where we give out Bibles to our first graders. Notice what Jesus said, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. A disciple obeys God's commands. Now, here's what we understand as a disciple. God didn't give us his commands because he didn't want us to have fun. And many people think that. Here's why God gave you commands, because he created you, and he wants you to have a fulfilled, abundant, joy-filled life. And so what he's done is he's given you some parameters. We call them commands. And he says, if you get outside of this, it will lead to destruction in your life. And so he gives commands like, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't covet your neighbor's property, and don't lie and don't steal. And, and he's saying, look, I, I love you so much. I want to provide the way for you to have true life, abundant life, joy-filled life. And it's by keeping my commands. So a disciple of Christ doesn't just know God's word. They live according to God's word. They obey God's commands. Thirdly, a disciple of Christ walks with God's people. Now, we've talked about this a lot, but it's so important. They walk with God's people. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. You see that encourage one another and build each other up? Do you know in Scripture there's over 50 commands that we call one another's that the Bible gives us? That we're to love one another. We're to pray for one another. We are to encourage one another. We are to confess our faults one to another. We're to rejoice one another. We're to mourn with each other. That there are commands in Scripture that can only be done in the context of walking with God's people. Four reasons why it's so important you plug in and get in. And by the way, this weekend we'll have somewhere between 16, 1,700 people on, in five services. God's not calling you to walk with 1,600 people. That's the church. But you're to find a group of people. I mean, let's face it. One of the commands is, is confess your faults one to another. Anybody want to take the first shot at that one? Anybody want to confess your sins right here in front of us all? No. But there needs to be some people that I am so close to that I can say, guys, here's where I'm struggling. Understand, Jesus gave us the model. He had the 12 disciples, and then in the 12 disciples, he had the three, Peter, James, and John. Jesus modeled for us that we need people in our lives that we're walking with. And, and, and four reasons why this is so important. Number one, because you were created for community. Um, you were created for community. Again, we've talked about this so much lately. God created everything, said it was good. He created man, said not good. 
Sherry Turkle is a, a sociologist and psychologist, and in her book, The Second Self, Computers and the Human Spirit, she shares a story of her young teenage daughter having a sleepover. And they had her daughter invited about eight or nine of her friends over, and they ate dinner, and then they all went to the den, and she went back in her bedroom to read. And she came out to check on him before she went to sleep, and she said, I walked in the den, and she said, here's what I saw. Every one of those girls was on their iPhones. They were texting, they were updating their status, they were checking Facebook, or maybe they had their earbuds in and they were listening to music. And she said, I came to understand that, that the world has changed. So when I grew up and we had sleepover, we were doing each other's nails, we were doing each other's hairs, we were talking about boys, and, and we talked about deep stuff in those times. And that we as a culture have lost the ability to truly live in community. And God would say that is not good. And we need to have people in our lives that really know us, that, that we can be ourselves with and that we can be vulnerable with because we were created for that. You need people in your life that you can share your struggles, your sins and your victories with. You need people in your life that you can pray with. Secondly, you need people in your life who you're going to be on mission with. That's why he calls you to walk with God's people. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. None of us can do alone what God has called us to do together. And it's only in community that we can truly live out the greatest impact in our lives. So God says, I'm calling you to community because I've given you stuff to do and you're only going to be able to accomplish your mission in life and your ministry in life uh, in the context of community, walking with God's people. Thirdly, I need people to watch out for me in my life. Let me explain what I mean. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul speaking says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Now, Paul is really setting them up. And, you know, he's, he asks this question. He says, um, by the way, if there's any encouragement from being united with Christ, now that you're a Christian, you find, well, let me see, Paul, before I knew Christ, I was a hell-bound sinner. Now I'm a forgiven, uh, heaven-bound saint. Yeah, I think I find some encouragement from being united with Christ, right? In other words, he's asking a very silly question. He's asking a question that's already answered itself before he, he even asked it. He might as well have just said, now, since you have been encouraged, uh, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ and since you have comfort from his love and since you have fellowship with the Spirit and in uh, tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love and being one in spirit and purpose. Look at verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I need people to watch out for me in my life, and here's why. Every one of us has blind spots and weak areas. We all have areas where we are vulnerable to sin and discouragement. And so let me ask you this. Who do you have in your life that's going to help you stay on track spiritually? I'll take it a step further. Who do you have in your life who has permission to push you spiritually, to grow deeper in your faith, to, to be more involved in God's work? Who is there in your life that you've given permission to that they can come and tell you, son, it looks like you're messing up in this area. You really need to think about it. Or they can come up and ask you the tough questions. How's your marriage? You being a good dad? You spend enough time at home? And, and they're the ones who are, why? Because we all have blind spots, guys. And, and here's the, let me just tell you the truth. None of you are doing as good as you think you're doing. 
And you need people to point out those areas. Now, we'll say this. As a pastor, I know how that feels, right? <laughs> There's always somebody willing to point out your mess-ups, right? But, but there should be that in our personal life. All of us should have those people who are going to watch out for us in life. Uh, they need permission for that. And we need, to, we need to be that for somebody else too. And then thirdly, I, I need others who will wait with me and weep with me. Look at Romans 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. God says, look, you have got to have community because you need people that are going to walk through those valleys of life with you. They're going to be there with you when you're waiting for potential bad news. They're going to weep with you when that news comes. I need people and you need people to be with you in those inevitable crises and tragedies of life. There are some situations that no one should walk through alone. Heard the story a while back about a man in Texas who died in his house and they found his body two years later. We need people in our lives who are there for us. That We call them those 2 o'clock in the morning people. They, we can call those people 2 o'clock in the morning and say, man, would you pray for me? Or here's what's just happened. I need somebody. Can you come over? We need to, to that community. We're, thirdly, a disciple walks with God's people. Number four, a disciple contributes to God's work. I said this, God didn't call you into, uh, he didn't save you into the family so that you can sit on the sidelines. He called you into the family because you have something to bring to the family. And he wants everyone to contribute to the mission and ministry of the church that he's called us to. And, and that we all have a part to play. Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What that verse is saying is that when he called you, he already had stuff he wanted you to do. And he created you to do those things. When you became a Christian, you received Christ, but you also received a responsibility and that is to join others in carrying out the mission and ministry of Christ through the church. Now, the Bible we already mentioned calls the church many things. It calls the church the, the, the body. I mean, it calls church the family. It calls the church the bride and the flock. But it does call it the body, and here's why. What Scripture teaches is that all of us, God gives us different roles, and that it's only in coming together with our gifts and talents and temperaments and ministering together that we can optimally serve God. So some people in this room are, are the hands. Some people are the feet. Some people are the ears, and, and we all have a role that we play, and then we find our place in the body uh, to serve so that we can carry out the ministry of the church. One of the reasons I'm pumped about the month of missions is because we're also going to talk to you about how clear we're going to make that process of discovering what part you are in the body and how you plug into that part. But all of us are to be a part of what God is doing. But here's the problem with the church in America. The church in America has what they call the 20-80% principle. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, and here's what it is. 20% of the people in the church in America does 80% of the ministry. 20% of the, of the people in church in America give 80% of the tithes and offerings. And that is unbiblical. God calls every one of us to be a part of the mission of what he's called to do. Now, imagine what would happen. Now, I would say we're higher than 2080. We're probably more like 30, 70, 35, 65. But still, think about what would happen if everybody caught the mission and became involved in what God wanted them to do. Man, we could turn the world upside down. And so that is, but, but let, me, let me try to drive this point home, 20-80% and the church being the body of Christ. Imagine your physical body. What would happen if in your physical body, 20% of your physical body was doing 80% of the work? We call that a coma. And the church in America today, today is in a spiritual coma. 
because too many people are sitting on the sidelines. And, and so God wants us all to be a part of his work. Uh, it, there's a whole series we can do this, but three things real quick to help us get our hands around. Three things he's called us to give. Number one, he calls us to give of our time. He calls us to give of our time. Now think about this. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we're to pray, God, would you bring a little bit of heaven on earth? And, and by the way, God, not through me because I don't have the time. No, if we're going to pray that, we've got to be available for God to use us in the process. And, and so to be involved and engaged in the life of the church means that we're going to give time to the mission and ministry of the church. To be a disciple means that we discipline ourselves to do the things that are most important. And that means giving time. Secondly, give of our talents. And by talents, this can be natural talents that were given to you at birth, and, or it could be uh, your, your spiritual gifts that he gives you when you're reborn. And, and here's what Scripture says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all to the glory of God. And, and so, so you're doing it to advance the mission and, and to, um, uh, to see people come to know Christ, and you're impacting, I mean, you're, you're contributing to the work of the church. And then thirdly, we're to give of our treasures. And for me, this is the fun one, because you get to play a vital role in what God is doing in the church by giving to God's kingdom work through the church. And by giving of our tithes and our offerings, here's what the, the Bible promises. Number one, you're going to find a joy in your life in giving. Because giving brings with it so many benefits. Giving is the antidote for materialism. Giving is be, being able to see God bless you financially. Uh, and, and by that, I don't mean the name and claim it. I just mean that when we're obedient to, to what he's called us to do, he'll bless us in the process. And, and, and then here's what scripture also says, that when you give joyfully, that you're building treasures in heaven. In other words, you're sending uh, an investment ahead. Here's what Jesus said one time. He said, why do you guys, I'm paraphrasing on this, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Why do you guys spend so much time focusing on the things of this world where, first of all, they're going to rust, moth are going to come in and eat those fancy clothes, or a thief could come in and take it. Why do you spend so much time worrying and putting so much in on that? You're worried so much about something that next year you're going to sell at a garage sale. But you got to have it, right? But it's just, it doesn't matter. And so why are you worrying so much about that stuff? He says, but look, let me tell you, there's a way where you can invest and get eternal rewards for it. You ought to check that one out. We give of our time, our talents, and our treasures. Uh, the fourth W is, is that we contribute.